Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Merry Florida Christmas. <laughs> you know, I actually I am really enjoying not being in a Michigan Christmas where I grew up. Um, I know uh, the Christmas I grew up with, probably a number of you did, right, was the one with the drifts this high or this high, depending, right? And you bundle like three layers on. It really, that, that movie, A Christmas Story, that's supposed to happen in Cleveland, I remember those days. I remember getting my tongue stuck on an aluminum door because I tried to do, not on a pole, but on a door. And I remember the times you'd walk out of the house looking like, uh, I don't know what, the, the, the Pillberry Doughboy, right? Or the Marshmallow, or the Michelin Man, I guess. And, um, and the light and the darkness and a fire in the fireplace and some hot cocoa and just sitting there. None of which is in the original Christmas at all, right? None of it. And um, I think the point is so often we have, uh, so many times, and have you noticed how much Christmas is about everything but Christmas? Christmas has been... Um, commodified. And what's really running Christmas now is commerce. Uh, I'm not really saying anything new. I know. I know. Actually, what's so amazing, I was just listening to a podcast this week, and I know I'm off topic already, but we're going to get there. Um, and um, what's fascinating about the New Testament, I don't know if you realize this, but each of the letters that were written, 90% of the people at the time could not read. And a person took the letter, not because they had to. Um, they could have paid someone. Paul could have paid someone to take one of the letters to the church, drop it off, and let them read it. But what they always did is they had a person deliver the letter, and a person read the letter, and a person helped them understand the letter time after time after time. And what you find out through the Bible, there has never been a time where God has mediated his message without a person involved in it. It's not like you can stand at a distance. It's not like you've got... And so what we find is we have always put things in the way of the real message and the person of Jesus Christ. And so in this series, even though it's kind of snarky that we're looking at a Florida Christmas, what we're trying to do is look at how Christmas relates to us and Jesus, who is personally present and is personally showing up this morning. Anytime his gospel is preached, he is present wherever two or three are gathered in his name. And that's what we're really after, is his presence, not a bunch of presents. <laughs> Sorry, kids. OK? So today we're going to discover, when God talks about his future, that basically Christmas was what Christmas would bring the future that God would have. He doesn't use the metaphors that we so often associate with Christmas, like the North Pole or reindeer herds. He uses a metaphor that we understand in Florida called Sea World. <laughs> now, not this little Sea World that happens to be in Orlando, not an amusement park, but rather the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. This happens, actually, in one of the biggest messianic promises from the prophet, the person of Isaiah, who speaks this word about how God will send a person, the little branch, the young sapling, the shoot from the stump of Jesse, and what will happen as a result is the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. So that's what we're going to look at this morning in Isaiah chapter 11. And uh, a gathering together is so important, and I'm glad we were able to do that. Um, but we want you to in person with each other in your homes on Sunday, December 25th, to celebrate and worship together in your homes. And the premiere of our service will be at 10 a.m., but afterwards you can watch it on demand. Okay? Let's get to the text now. 
Isaiah 11, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted, fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. So when you see the future of this world, the future of God's creation, the plan that God has, do you see sea world? That is, that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Do you see how God is describing here through Isaiah universal peace with all the hostilities of this world taken away. It's just unimaginable, like how Carl Gaelic said last week, God makes these astronomical promises, literally, as many as the stars in the sky, or the sand on the seashore, or here today, um, as the knowledge, you know, as wide and deep and broad as the ocean, the water's gonna cover the, as the water covers the ocean, so will the knowledge of the Lord cover the earth. Do you see that as the future? You know, when I look at our future, <laughs> it doesn't feel that, uh, um, that great and glorious, does it? It's more ominous these days. Feels, uh, you know, we've got, we have had terrorist threats. We've got corporate greed going on. We have foreign powers dominating the world stage, political infighting, pandemics, conspiracy theories, ecological disasters, technological hijinks, all of this going on all at the same time. And if we would choose and project our future from this point going forward, it doesn't look so great. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible did not, in Isaiah's day, look at the present state of the Davidic kingdom that Isaiah was under, the king on the throne, the situation around with Babylon and Assyria and Egypt and all these powers. Isaiah didn't just sit there and go like, okay, now what's going to happen here if and how are we going to move forward? No, the Bible doesn't proclaim a future that makes sense with what's going on in the present. Like, that's just extrapolated from it. Rather, the Bible looks from the future that God has promised into our present. That's why um, Jürgen Moltmann said this, we don't look at the present into the future, but from the future into the present. And that's what the word Advent actually is about. The season of Advent, that word means appearing, but it doesn't mean just looking at the future from today. It means looking at what God has promised as a future and bringing it back into the present. It's as if we have Jesus Christ when he is born into the manger, born of a virgin on earth. He is a man from the future coming into our presence to change the total trajectory of our present time in a different way that it wouldn't have happened if he hadn't been born. And he's the guarantee. He is our future in person. And what he has accomplished, how he has lived, he is what we shall become. As uh, 1 John would say in his letter, you don't know what you're going to look like? Well, look to Jesus, and that's what we're going to look like when he comes in glory. And so Isaiah's perspective is what will happen. And he says in Isaiah 11, 9, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And so from this, we're going to learn these three points, hopefully not too long. 
and concise, but um, that God doesn't do what you expect, and then God doesn't do what you deserve, and that you need to see the world as a sea world. Okay? So God doesn't do what, we, what you, God does what you don't expect. Um, we see this in this passage from how unconventional Isaiah talks about the Messiah. And that's what the term, that little shoot coming from the stump of Jesse. So he's got this picture that he starts out in Isaiah 11 as this tree that has been chopped down. And he, rightly so, talks about the dynasty of David, Jesse his father, David, and all the kings after them that God had promised to David that he would always have someone on the throne from the Davidic line. But Isaiah and the other prophets said they have been unfaithful, and the majority of them had been. A few exceptions, Hezekiah, you know, Josiah. But the majority had been just terribly egotistical, self-centered, unfaithful kings to both the people and to God. And Isaiah preaches, it's getting chopped down. It's going to be destroyed. There will be no more kings. So all you got is a stump. So if you really want to do the original Christmas, take your tree out and put a stump in the middle of your living room. <laughs> then you have an Isaiah-styled Christmas. And Isaiah says, that's, historically, that's actually what happened. After Isaiah, as the prophet's time, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken away never to be heard from again, and the southern kingdom of Judah was taken off into captivity in Babylon, and the book of 2 Kings ends with one of those kings from the line of David finally released from prison and eating at, the, at Nebuchadnezzar's table in Babylon, and the story ends like, wait a minute, what happened? Uh, it's kind of like... Um, wait a minute, there's no more kings. There's no more temple. Where's this future God has promised? This makes no sense. And there were no more kings. And though they rebuilt the temple, the priesthood had kind of fallen apart too. There was just not much left. When Israel came back 70 years later to the land, there was not much it never quite, and they were never in charge anymore. It was always somebody else. The Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. They were never in charge, and they never had another king. And yet, Isaiah says, a little shoot will come out of this stump. Other passages will talk about a tiny branch. And the little shoot won't look so great. Have you ever seen a stump and then the little tree sapling come out of it? It just doesn't look like much, right? It's, no, it's not as grand as the original. And um, this little shoot wouldn't be like a giant sequoia or even a towering cedar from Lebanon. Instead, Isaiah speaks of a different way to be a king and a different look. Someone probably that would, you could pass by and not think much of. And yet, through this little tiny shoot, God's going to do the greatest work ever. That's what Isaiah is saying. Makes no sense. Doesn't fit the way I've been taught on strategic planning. I don't know if you've done any strategic planning ever for a business or a corporation or an organization. What you do, you usually start off with, um, OK, where do we want to go? And you, you pick the ideal future, envision it, spell it out, set some goals to get there, critical targets, and then strategies, and then action steps. And who's going to do what and the budget and everything else. You get this all lined up for a business, an organization, a strategic plan. And here, God's strategic plan, it's like totally unconventional. So let's say you wanted to set these as your visionary goals, that in 2,000 years from now, almost everyone in the world will know your name. 
About 2,000 years from now, one quarter of the world's population will treat you as the center of their lives and center their lives on you. And 2,000 years from now, <clears throat> your teaching will be considered by the entire world and not just those that follow you as some of the most important body of thought in all of world history. So if that's your goals, what are you going to do today, right? I would say you start trying to figure out what marketing plan you'll put in place, what budget you will need, and who are the most influential people in this world that you're going to, to hobnob with in order to get that word out. And God does none of that. Jesus ends up being like this tiny little shoot, this nothing of a person in a sense, and he chooses, of all the places that God would choose, he chooses the backwaters of Palestine, the area to grow up in Galilee, to be born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, to be born in a manger, not in a palace, to spend your entire life, he spends his entire life hardly ever in a metropolitan area. Jerusalem wasn't that big. It was even not the center of the Roman Empire by any means. And he was only in Jerusalem a few weeks out of his 30 years. Most of the time, he spent it with the poorest of the poor in areas of the rural population and among people of no educational background or consequence. He never wrote a book. He didn't sit down and create his own like life plan and share it with the world. And yet, as Jesus violates all our worldly standards of wisdom and power and might, he accomplishes what nobody else can do with all the power in the world. And that's why uh, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians about how God works. He says, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So Jesus' strategic plan was not for him to become rich and famous. His strategic plan wasn't to get people to like him. Thumbs up. It was to save them. To change their destiny. To have the knowledge of the Lord cover the earth as the waters cover the sea by giving his life for this world. So God does what we don't expect and accomplishes so much more than we could ever anticipate. But he also then does what we don't deserve. Isaiah says here in this text, by the way, that Jesus is going to judge the poor. Now, that does not mean <laughs> he's like sitting up there with a the big wig and kind of making some rules or something and or making some, enacting some laws or legis. What it means is as a judge in the Bible, he is going to rescue the poor. He's going to bring equity to the meek. He is going to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. He is going to help those who cannot help themselves. He doesn't do it so he gains anything for it. He does it so that he transforms all of life. This is not a transactional relationship at all. He doesn't do it for us if we start and do something for him. He doesn't do this for us in as much as we could do something for him. He doesn't do for us what we better do for him in response. He does everything for us, judges the poor, rescues the weak, heals the sick, cares for shepherds, gives his life for everyone on this earth, despite the fact that we can do nothing for him. That's grace. You get a Messiah you don't deserve at Christmas. You now, later on, Isaiah says um, about this humble king, he writes, 
For he grew up before him like a young plant. And by the way, the word young plant there is the same exact word for tender shoot that occurs earlier. It's just um, in the ESV, it's not translated as such. And he grew, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. This quote is from the beginning of Isaiah 53 which becomes this amazing poem and ode to one who would suffer and die a humiliating death in the place of people who ultimately, and uh, he ultimately would be vindicated. Goes on to say things like, by his wounds we are healed. He carried our grief and our sorrows. We did not esteem him. He was stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. This is the tender shoot. So vulnerable and open and exposed. And it all starts at Christmas. Now, you might get a few gifts from friends. Maybe even Santa will visit your house if you're, if you're nice and not naughty. Right? Do you remember how that goes? I never got a lump of coal, though, so... I don't know what that says. Did, did anybody ever get a lump of coal in a sock? I know I should have. Yeah. But this is a Messiah, this tender shoot. Jesus is one who doesn't give to those who deserve it. And that's why the waters that cover the sea is like the knowledge of the Lord covering the whole earth. The world understands religions, but... Um, they only really understand two types of religion. The first is a moralistic religion. That is, you get what you deserve. That's karma, as an example. Man, you get what you deserve. And um, God sets up standards, or there's standards, and you've got to meet them. And if you're one of the good people, you're good. And if you're one of the bad people, well, so bad. Uh, for you. The world understands that. And that's why we have so much jibber jabber all over social media about this person or that person and, and everybody trying to put people into that group or this group and complaining about this and that and how it is amazing, the world understanding this kind of religion, how there's so little grace and forgiveness and mercy for anyone in a world filled with a bunch of self-righteous people condemning other people. That's what social media has basically become because that's the religion the world understands. It only works for good people. And the other kind of religion the world understands is one of acceptance, tolerance. Can't we just all get along? Let everybody do their own thing. The world understands that kind of religion of relativism and no standards at all. And yet nobody can really live by that either, because we don't get along. <laughs> For all the talk about trying to get along, we sure don't. There's more violence and death and destruction in this world than ever before. Those are the two types of religions the world understands. Christianity is so different. Because God doesn't just accept you as you are. I know we say that, but he also wants to transform who you are into what he wants you to be. God loves you. God cares for you. God welcomes you. And then works with you and works on you as well. It's both a religion of acceptance, but a religion also of us growing into whom God wants us to be. And that's a religion that actually is universal. What does this all mean? It means that we can see the world as sea world. The whole earth to be filled with the knowledge of this Lord as the waters cover the sea. Isaiah speaks not of a moralistic savior or a relativistic Lord. But he speaks of the God who is, who comes to earth as a person. A religion that is for everyone. 
And we see that in the life of Jesus. Some people didn't like it that he was for the masses, that he cared for the poor, that he'd welcome anyone in and work with them. And he also transformed lives of people like Zacchaeus and others. And he does so at great cost. Because grace is not cheap. It may be free but it's absolutely costly. There is judgment on injustice with this Messiah. He judges for the poor. He brings equity to the world. On the pride and the violence and the arrogance, but the justice falls on himself, and he is condemned. And God takes all the wrath and places it on Jesus at that cross for you. He shows you what you deserve and gives you what you don't. So that is a different kind of faith that the world is not sure what to do with. And yet everyone fits. Everyone fits into this. No matter your status, your ethnic background, your language, Whatever you've done, you're welcome. So we can see the world through this future that God intends here in Isaiah chapter 11. Um, What does that mean? I think Hans Schwartz in his one book might have said it best. He said, Jesus is the paradigm and the anticipation of our own future, and at the same time, the inspiration and the possibility of living toward that future. In Jesus, God's love was announced to us before his kingdom had fully come. Thus, the coming of the kingdom should not cause surprise or terror. Since Jesus announced it, we are able to open ourselves up to God's future. We can find communion with him who decides the future of all things and can anticipate the final significance and essence of all things. So we look at Jesus as our future. We see who we will be because of who Jesus is, how he lived. He lived as the first fully human being since Adam and Eve to be everything God wanted him to be. And he is going to draw you to be that too. So you don't have to live by the calculus of this culture where everything All technology, all politics, everything is about a transaction. In the end, it's all about commerce. It's all monetized, our world, isn't it? Everything is about what can I get out of you? How can I get something? What am I gaining? And Christianity says no. It is what God has given. How God has, at great cost, saved and redeemed me. And now it's about what I can give. So don't live by the calculus of this world. Live instead by the calculus of the cross. So do the unexpected, just like God does. And do the undeserved, just like God does. That's living into the future that we've got. A future I can't even hardly anticipate because it's going to be so grand and glorious. Isaiah, I think, is even constrained in his own words to describe it. It's like, okay, so the lion and the lamb together, the child at the cobra's den, unbelievable. And yet that is the future that we have in Jesus Christ. And that is where we're headed. And that is what's going to happen. And that's why you can live and I can live in a way that um, makes people go like, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. I don't understand what you're doing. Why are you doing this? Why are you giving so much away? Why do you care about me? Why are you spending time on me? Why do you, why do, you do what you're doing? This makes no sense. It does when you see the future we have, the sea world that God is going to bring about. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day Um, as we anticipate uh, Christmas. We are anticipating the future that Isaiah states here, and it looks a lot more like uh, a view out, out into the gulf 
the expansiveness, Lord, of your love and grace in Jesus Christ, the truth that came in him, the wideness of your mercy, the depth of your love, Lord, and the fact that the knowledge of you will cover the whole earth as the waters cover the sea. That is a promise that you have made that is hard for us to even imagine, and yet we're going to trust you on that, Lord God. And we realize Jesus started that. That's what the king, he opened the kingdom up to us by coming to us. He was not, Father, um, you sent a son. You didn't send just a word like an information. You sent your son in person to fellowship with us personally, that he is the message. And his life was the medium to share with us all, Lord. We are amazed at that. So often, Lord, we have turned um, this time of the year into just one commercial transaction after another rather than um, appreciating the relationship we have with you and with others. We ask, Lord, that you would move us more into a deeper fellowship with you this Christmas, to a deeper appreciation of how you, the tiny little branch, Jesus, became the one, the only. And the knowledge, Lord, that we would spread your word, your grace, and your goodness and truth across this world. We pray, Lord, this is not always an easy time of the year for people. Those who are grieving the loss of loved ones this day, Lord, those who are facing um, difficult times in our economy, those who are under um, sickness. We pray, Lord, your healing hand, your guidance, your presence. We need you more than we need anything, Lord. We pray that you'd bring your comfort and your peace. And I, we know that that comes because you come into this world, Lord Jesus. So bring that healing, Lord, that love, that mercy to many. And help us, O oh Lord, to be your personal presence in the lives of others this Christmas time. Lord God, we lift up to you um, this world. Um, Jesus, you are called the Prince of Peace, and we don't see a lot of peace. There are so many wars and conflicts <laughs> and then even conflicts on a personal level, Lord, that we um, have experienced. And we pray, Lord, that this Christmas, this season, um, your peace reigns in our lives, that we not only experience it personally, but we can share it with others. Heavenly Father, as we prepare for the Lord's Supper this day, we pray that you would draw us closer fill us more. We know that you personally come to us, Lord Jesus. You would never hold back, but you give yourself to us, and we are amazed at that. Prepare our hearts and our lives to receive, Lord, this day. We know um, we are unworthy. We don't deserve you. We can't anticipate it, and yet you give yourself, Lord, and we only come because you you tell us to take and eat, to take and drink. And so we will come to receive as you uh, choose to give. So we pray, Lord, um, that you prepare us for that. And you prepare us as well, Lord, to respond in joy and in devotion to you and in love to others this week. All things we lift up to you, Lord Jesus, this day. In your precious name, amen.